we are discussing particle in a 1D box and we have succeeded in so far uh, learning about the wave functions of a quantum particle in a one dimensional box. And the wave functions have turned out to be uh, sine waves and we have seen that only some will be allowed. The wave function that we have established so far are psi, at a, psi of x is equal to root over 2 by L sine n pi x by L where n equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth positive integer. And we have established that this set of wave functions well we have normalized that is how we got root 2 by L. We have also established that they are orthogonal to each other that is where we stopped in the last module. And we have also shown that the first derivative is not continuous at x equal to 0 and x equal to L. So, that really is not such a stringent condition on a wave function. The next step is to understand what are the energies. Since only certain wavelengths are uh, only certain wave functions are allowed only certain energies will be allowed as well. So, let us see how we get to that. This here is the expression for energy for a free particle if you remember. And this is the energy that our particle would have as long as it is inside the box and it can be only inside the box e equal to h cross square k square by 2 m. But then we have also learned from the boundary condition that psi must vanish at x equal to L that k L is equal to n pi and n is a positive integer. So, the obvious next step is to take this k L in equal to n pi expression and plug it in to the energy expression of a free particle. The moment we do that the energy expression becomes E of n is equal to n square h square by 8 ml square where n is a positive integer. What just happened? Well quantization of energy happened. Now we are saying that only certain values are allowed and now we should say something that we deliberately did not say while discussing the wave functions in the last module. What is n? n turns out to be a quantum number for the particle in a box. And this is the beauty of Schrodinger's treatment. Unlike Bohr's treatment where the quantum numbers fell from the sky, quantum numbers arise naturally simply from the probabilistic interpretation of the wave function provided by Max Born. Here we see an example of energy like energy other quantities like uh, momentum, angular momentum these are also quantized and everything arises from the imposition of some boundary condition or the other. So, now we learn a very very important lesson in quantum mechanics. We learn that quantization finds its origin in the boundary conditions which we know arise out of Born interpretation. This is very important to understand. Um, I have seen many students who have got uh, MSc in chemistry good marks and all but and they can do the math associated with quantum mechanics. But this very fundamental uh, concept uh, has sometimes not sunk in. Let us all be very clear about this. This is a one of the founding tenets of founding principles of quantum mechanics that quantization really arises out of boundary conditions. The moment that happens we can breathe easy. Now our conscience is clear we have not imported a quantum number from uh, anywhere just to satisfy some experimental ex observation somewhere. It has ar arisen naturally out of boundary condition. This is a great revelation. But that is not all. What we see in a particle in a box is that look at the energy ladder the separation in energies increases as you go higher and higher up ok that is one thing. The second thing is 
another important observation a zero energy is not possible because the smallest value of n the quantum number is 1 and for that energy has a value of h square divided by 8 ml 8 ml square which is non zero. This brings us to the concept of zero point energy and this is something that becomes uh, a governing factor when we discuss a uh, simple harmonic oscillator. We find that a free particle a quantum free particle can never be at rest and it can never be at rest because if it is at rest is going to violate uncertainty principle. Let us see it comes to rest it would have come to rest at some position. So, x is defined precisely delta x is 0 and since it has come to rest completely the momentum is also 0 plus minus 0. So, delta x into delta p x is 0 that violates uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle we are going to talk a little more about uncertainty principle later on when we take a break from this quantum mechanical systems and discuss the operators and demonstrate uh, uncertainty principle nicely using the position and momentum operators. But then the thing is uh, uncertainty principle is a law of nature it is a boundary beyond which one cannot probe nature. So, it is not a question of making a better equipment that will let us see something you cannot see today we can never do it as far as the current understanding of quantum mechanics is you cannot do better than the best you cannot violate uncertainty principle and that is why a free particle can never be at rest because that would violate uncertainty principle since it would be associated with zero uncertainties of conjugate properties that is an another important revelation from particle in a box. Right. Now, let us talk about the energy gaps between successive levels what about that if we take uh, any energy gap well uh, right now it is E f minus E i. So, n f square minus n i square let us say I take n f square to be n i square plus 1 uh, we can work out what the gap will be let us take keep it simple let us say n equal to 1 n equal to 2 2 square is 4 1 square is 1 whatever it is no matter which pair of quantum numbers you take you get a constant for that constant what is the value of h square by 8 ml square if I change L if in L is increased since L square is in the denominator energy gap between the two chosen energy levels is going to decrease larger the box smaller is the energy gap actually I should not have written h new here that would should come after another piece of discussion that we have coming up but well bear with me until then we are really talking about the energy gaps. So, if L is small then energy gaps are larger if L is large then energy gaps are smaller what does that mean if you keep on increasing the size of the box the energy levels keep coming closer and closer and closer. So, beyond a certain value the energy levels will come so close to each other that you cannot tell between this energy level and the next one. So, you do not have discrete energy levels anymore rather you have a band that would be the classical limit. So, this is another beautiful thing that comes out of our discussion just by changing the dimension of the box one can go from quantum world to classical world and back and it makes perfect sense in both the worlds. This is another point of strength another reason why we gain confidence in this treatment. Now, comes the discussion that should have come before I could write h nu let us talk a little bit about the spectroscopy. So, what is spectroscopy? Spectroscopy is the interaction of radiation with matter and essentially it involves transition from one energy level to the other and 
uh, to be honest we are not uh, spectroscopy is something that is not at all new to us because uh, after all uh, quantum mechanics is something that has sort of arisen out of spectroscopy. I am uh, deeply indebted to a colleague who many many years ago told me that uh, spectroscopy is just quantum mechanics in action. All these calculations that we do in quantum mechanics is manifested in interaction of radiation with matter because that is the only way in which you can probe the energetics of a system experimentally and quantum mechanics is all about uh, the energy levels and wave functions and so on and so forth. Now see just because there are two levels it does not mean that a transition will necessarily take place. In spectroscopy something that is very important is selection rule and selection rule which tells us which transitions are allowed and which transitions are not arises from something called transition moment integral. Transition moment integral is integral psi 2 mu psi 1 and the condition is that this transition moment integral must be non-zero. Now I think we might have introduced this nomenclature earlier as well but just to make sure in case we have not let me just do it once again. Uh, what we have written here is this in Dirac's notation this is called ket vector sorry bra vector and when we write a wave functions inside it let us say I write psi 2 in a ket vector bra vector bra vector it essentially means psi 2 star complex conjugate of psi 2. Of course in our case we do not really have to worry about complex conjugates because uh, our wave functions of particle in a box are all real. This is bra vector. If you write like this so this is psi 1 in what is called ket vector and what it essentially means is uh, you can just write psi 1 itself. A lot of complicated discussion becomes simpler if one uses bracket notation. In our case it is almost trivial we might as well write the uh, integral but it at least saves us the hassle of writing d tau and all that all the time. So we will use bracket notation but uh, I should tell you what this means what we have written here. When you write like that so when you write bra psi 2 ket psi 1 then it essentially means integral over all space psi 2 star psi 1 d tau. In our case d tau can be should be replaced as dx because we are working in one dimensional space. Now one more thing it is possible that I might want to multiply this psi 1 by something or make some operator operate on something. What we have done is that we have used the operator dipole moment operator which means basically multiplication by dipole moment. So this is what it means but you might notice that there is an additional uh, vertical line after mu like this that is just to make things look good it still means bra psi 2 ket psi 1 uh, ket mu psi 1 this is what it means this is your transition moment integral. And the condition for transition moment integral is that for transition moment integral to be non-zero is uh, what we have to determine if we want to know which transitions take place and which transitions do not take place. For that purpose we are going to use here the uh, property of symmetry of wave functions. One can of course plug in the expressions for wave functions and do it the hard way work out the integral and that has to be done uh, many times but many times you do not have to go through all that hassle. Symmetry is a fundamental property of systems which determines uh, many of its aspects. So uh, here we will see how nicely one can use symmetry arguments to determine whether this integral is 0 or not. Remember we do not really need to know at this point whether the, what the value of the integral is if that is what we require then of course we have to work it out. 
But if you only want to know whether it is 0 or non 0 we will see how we can do it nicely with symmetry. To do that uh, let us first recognize that all these wave functions where n is odd this one or this one n equal to 1 n equal to 3 these are symmetric with respect to inversion. What is the meaning of symmetric with respect to inversion? If I uh, say this is psi 1 right, so I write something like this psi 1. And then I invert it, so I interchange 0 and L in this case let us say. Then upon inversion it will remove psi 1, it will remain uh, psi 1. That is the definition of being symmetric or what is called an even function. However, look at this n equal to 2 or this n equal to 4. What happens if I interchange 0 and L? The function is going to change shape right. Now this is plus psi 2. If I interchange 0 and L you are going to have a function that essentially will look like this. So upon inversion what happens for n equal to 2, 4 etc where n is even we get psi n becomes minus psi n and that makes it anti-symmetric with respect to inversion and such functions are called odd functions. Let me digress a little bit and uh, point out that the number of nodes Remember what nodes means, nodes mean nodes, node means a point where the wave function go through 0 and change sign. So, uh, this is not a node, this is. So, number of nodes is n minus 1, when n equal to 1 there is no node, number of nodes is 0, when n equal to 2 number of nodes is 1, when n equal to 3 number of nodes is 1 here and 1 here. So that is something that is uh, just there we should know it. Now coming back to our original discussion what uh, how do we know whether this integral is going to be 0 or not. Well let me write on this side so that I do not have to uh, erase it later on. Uh, see an integral is non 0 when let us call let me call this i the integrand this one is i. So what happens if i changes sign upon inversion? So let us say upon inversion i becomes minus i. What happens to the integral? The integral is i d tau over all space that becomes minus i d tau. But the issue is uh, we are talking about a transition between two levels that cannot change depending upon uh, which one we decide to be which point we decide to be 0 and which point we decide to be L. Just upon inversion the sign cannot change right. So when will this happen in any case? If this is equal to this we are saying that the integral cannot change upon changing sign. So that means integral i d tau must be equal to minus integral my integral i d tau must be equal to minus integral i d tau. When will that happen? When both are equal to 0 is not it? Say q equal to minus q only when q is equal to 0 otherwise it is impossible. So what we learn is that this i has to be symmetric. And I here is a triple product, two wave functions and your uh, dipole moment. Is dipole moment symmetric or is it anti-symmetric? Let us not forget that we can write dipole moment as mu equal to E into x where E is electronic charge, x is displacement, x. Is it symmetric or is it anti-symmetric? Well, we have said this already that a symmetric integrand is required for uh, the integral to be non-zero. We are now asking the question what about x? Is it symmetric 
or is it anti symmetric? What happens when we invert x becomes minus x naturally? So, x is definitely anti symmetric. So, now when will this triple product be symmetric? So, uh, we are doing inversion right, we take this and do an inversion. When we do an inversion x changes sign, x becomes minus x. Let us say psi 2 is symmetric, so psi 2 will remain psi 2. Now if psi 1 is also symmetric what will happen? Then this triple product changes sign which means the integral changes sign which means the integral is 0. How can one avoid it? Only when psi is anti symmetric. So, if psi 2 is symmetric, psi 1 would better be anti symmetric, sorry for my horrible handwriting. Then what will happen is that due to x you have a minus sign, due to psi 1 also you have another minus sign and the whole thing becomes plus. So, what we are saying is that if one wave function is symmetric, the origin or the destination then the other the destination or the origin respectively has to be anti symmetric that is the condition for the transition moment integral to be non zero that is the condition for the transition to be what we call in the language of spectroscopy allowed so the selection rule then is delta n equal to 1 3 5 so on and so forth why because if you remember the wave functions alternate wave functions are symmetric and anti symmetric n equal to 1 symmetric n equal to 2 anti symmetric n equal to 3 symmetric again n equal to 4 anti symmetric once again. So, delta n equal to 2 can never happen what happens if I want to go from say psi 1 to psi 2 psi 1 is symmetric sorry psi 1 to psi 3 psi 1 is symmetric x is anti symmetric psi 3 is symmetric. So, psi 1 x psi 3 the whole thing is anti symmetric. So, that integral vanishes and that transition is not allowed. Now, if you want to know where this uh, transition moment integral comes from that requires a little more of quantum mechanics. In fact, we have discussed it in some detail in an earlier course that we had uh, floated in on NPTEL uh, a course on molecular spectroscopy a physical chemist perspective. So, whoever is interested in knowing more about where transition moment integrals come from uh, can go through those videos uh, of the course of that course uh, which are now freely available on YouTube I believe. But for the purpose of this course at least for now we are going to take this transition moment integral business axiomatically and we are going to proceed from here. So, doing that what we have learnt is that for a particle in a box delta n has to be 1 3 5 or to even even to our transitions are only allowed which means that you can have this transition 1 to 2, you can have this transition 1 to 4, but you cannot have this transition 1 to 3. Why not? Because as we said several times 1 and 3 are both symmetric making the triple product which is the integrand of transition moment integral anti symmetric. So, this is the discussion we wanted to have on spectroscopy of particle in a box and this is what tells us which transitions take place and which transitions do not. With this background we are now prepared to go ahead and talk about color and we are ready to talk about uh, whether or not there can be some application of this simple particle in a box in real chemical systems.